everyone, welcome to Studio Sunday. We hope you're staying warm and toasty. We know lots of the country is feeling the winter weather right now. Hang in there. Yeah, it's cold here. Well, that's all very <laughs> relative. Sweaty. It's cold here, it's 50 degrees. Freezing. <laughs> it is cold and windy. Yes. Houston Marathon is tomorrow, cold and windy. They like that though, don't they? I think so. I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, the serious runners yeah. and not the casual. I would not know about that. Um, so we wish them all the best. Yes. And if you get to the window, they're back. Maybe you'll have a record mile. That's right. Yeah. Okay. On to our news. Serial 10 is heading your way. It will be in stores a week later than we anticipated. So it'll be in there February 2nd instead of the 26th, I believe. Um, Show and tell. But these days we call that a win if it's a week late. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> so we're thrilled that it's uh, at least a dime at this point. Um, and Serial Cat and Mouse will be in stores on February 23rd. We got our copies today. Yeah. Or should I say yesterday? Yeah. Um, and you'll see that uh, in the stores on February 23rd and on our website as well. Uh, and then we'll see the omnibus in stores the last week in March or the first week in April, right around there. Right in time for our live event. Well, speaking of April, yeah. don't forget about Terry Moore Live. How can I forget? We're going to have 20,000 new sketches. <laughs> <laughs> it's April 1st through 3rd. Roughly. Lots of live panels, original art and sketches for sale. So okay. that'll be fun. Get that on your calendar, April 1st through 3rd. April Fool's Day. Yeah. How appropriate. We're not kidding though. We really will be there. <laughs> it's not a joke. So. Terry's also working on the new, on his new story for the Kickstarter, and it looks like we'll be launching that campaign in February. Come, um, more to come on that shortly. Okay. So we're. Yeah. We've had many discussions about it, and I've pitched a, a number of angles to Robin, and she's going, work a little more on it. So, try a little harder. Try a little harder. I'm trying to Nap less. <laughs> nap less, try harder. <laughs> that napping is writing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just letting my mind wander. Yeah, well, I, you try to wander straight up, would you? <laughs> Sitting up. Okay. Okay, um, we're also putting together the 2022 sketchbook, which should be out in early summer. Terry has done some killer sketches over the past year, so this should be a beautiful book. I think we'll see that probably in June. May or June. Okay. I'm not sure. We need okay. I'm ready anytime. <laughs> you tell me when to make it, I'll make it. Okay. So I say May or June. Okay. We'll see where we are in the in the scheme of things. Okay. Um, but that should be a great one. You've done some killer sketches over the last year. Thank you. Thank you. I've gotten really good at smiley faces. Happy stick, stick figures, figures. Yeah. yeah, yeah, triangles with legs, you name it, I go there. You're there, man. <laughs> You're a superstar. I've been practicing a lot. <laughs> hey, I I can't even do that. So. Oh no, you've drawn some really good stick figures. <laughs> Very expressive. Your stick figures Long make me legs, cry. Short legs, yeah, <laughs> I I do it all. <laughs> Every time, there's probably been three or four times that Robin has leaned over my shoulder and just grabbed a pencil and just put something on the page I'm drawing. I always, I always leave it there. So see if you can find a Robin doodle. It's, trust me, it is not a doodle you would ever find. Oh, it's in there. Oh, you won't be and able to find it. it's a secret code for something, you know. <laughs> find no, more it's old not. Teen. <laughs> He's making all that up. Don't start searching. Uh, so that's all I have. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Moore? Well, I was just gonna say, you know, by now, by the time you get 10, You'll have the whole run. He so. loves to show you. I do. He loves to show you what he's done. I do. I just love it's like having when you bring it in my something hand. home from kindergarten and say, "Look, mom, see what I made." Look, look, I made it with macaroni and paste, <laughs> and uh, I made this um, second trade paperback out of macaroni and paste too. So now we have the matching, you know, the spines and everything match and all that. Oh. So and does it make uh, you so happy? I am. I just like schoolwork. And um, the Robin, just before we started, Robin said that the printer has the proofs ready for the omnibus. So today I'll proof that, but uh, it looks really good too. So, and there's three versions, of course. There's a retail soft cover, retail hard cover, 
Um, and then there's the Abstract Studio special version, and that comes with a bookmark. And I yesterday I signed 650 of them and sent them back to the printer to be tipped into the book. So this one's nothing of 650, zero of 650. <laughs> well, we always print a few extra. That's mine. In name. case there's some damages. That's mine. I'm zero. Okay. Okay, that's all my show and tell, really. Um, okay, you ready to get on the hot seat? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay, our first question. This is a this is a hard question. Sorry. Okay. It's I, I've do I need been to asked this many times, but you know people really want to know. I may need to caffeinate. Our first question is from an aspiring comic book creator. Okay. I'm interested in publishing my own comic. Do you suggest starting in Artist Alley and then getting into stores? Should I approach distributors before I have a finished book? Help. It's uh, a big question. The distributors don't know what to do with you if you don't have a finished product ready for them. Uh, but retailers will talk to you if you show them what you're working on. Uh, that's what I did. I took my, uh, I drew out the entire first issue, but I just had, you know, Xeroxes of it uh, that I stapled together. And I went to the local convention and showed it to each retailer that had a table. And they're happy to talk to you. They're all looking for something new. So that went well for me that day. <laughs> I got a lot of encouragement. They said, yeah, if this was a printed comic, I would buy it. I would order it for the store. Um, so on that good day and that motivation, um, I did send it uh, to Diamond Comics and they carried it um, once I started self-publishing. So tell me that process. Uh, how did you get in touch with Diamond? They actually have a front door phone number, uh, but what I did was um, I made friends with Jeff Smith, who was uh, in his second year, and he was the first guy I met in comics. And Jeff shared his contact with me at Diamond and said, here's how you do it. But it wasn't just him. There were probably 10 different people that were self-publishing at the time that I was able to talk to at a convention. And all of them said, oh, here's who we talked to at this distributor. Here's who we talked to at that distributor. Um, also be sure to call this retailer over here because he has six stores. Call that retailer over there because he has four stores. So, you know, talk to him once and he orders for four different stores. Um, so that's how I did it. You know, you have to, little, you have to get out and network a little bit, uh, which is can, can be very strange for an artist, you know, because uh, it feels like you're you're doing your best in art if you get very uh, put, shut the world out and just focus on your art. But when it's time to get the art out there, you have to okay open the door and talk to the world. <laughs> oh, you hate that, don't you? Oh, it's hard. <laughs> and the the way I did it was uh, uh, that I think about it wasn't for me; it was for the art, and I'll fight for the art. So if it's me, I'll just go stand in the corner and let you guys do your thing. <laughs> but if it's my book, I want my book out there. So uh, it, it really helped me to get the courage to m make those cold calls, talk to people. And then of course, once I talked to them, it was, it was fine. It's, you know, there's no problem with calling anybody. They're happy to talk to you. So that's how I do it. You know, you, you talk to the retailers, uh, get distributor contacts from uh, the, the other artists that already have a comic, ask them where did you do it, who'd you call, get the name and number, call them, get your it's price. It's a little different when you started. There were so many distributors. There were. And now there are just a couple. So. But I do see, don't we see, uh, when we were going to the shows a year and a half ago, we saw so many people in Artist Alley that had a comic, a printed comic, uh, not just a, zero, uh, a Kinko's book where you take an 8, eight by 10 fold and have and staple it. Uh, that's very useful for Artist Alley, but you can get a, if you have just one book, you can get it printed. Um, and there's places, a lot of places, you can even print it at our printer in San Antonio. Brenner Printing. Brenner Printing. They print all of our uh, individual issues. Yes. So. Easy you, to work with. Absolutely. Quick. Very friendly. Yeah. Very professional. And they'll give you a real price. Uh, and then you get your book and you take it to the shows and sell it for retail. Yeah. Well, I hope that answers his question. I hope it helps. You have a lot of options. Yeah. Okay, our second question. How do you keep your comics from being dated 
it seems that SIP holds up as well today as when it first came out. Um, well, one thing I did was to uh, put them in generic clothing, first off. And you do that with most of your series. I do. That's why you see them mostly in jeans and t-shirts. Uh, that's timeless. Um, imagine if the, the SIP stuff had been in the fashion of the 80s or the 90s. That, you know, looks very dated now. Um, it does? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you see those big puffy dresses and all those teen <laughs> movies from the Brat Pack. Uh, yeah, not a, just stay classic with your clothing. And then when you, the story-wise, um, just write about human beings and that will never go out of style. Um, people uh, 200 years ago did the same thing we do today in terms of like love, romance, relationships, the pain, all the arguing, the happiness, the joy, having the babies, all that. Um, so it's timeless. And that's mostly what I focus on. And everything about the modern age is just my backdrop and my accessories to the story. Like, you can tell that we're in modern times, uh, but I don't make a big deal out of it. You know, it's not a character in the story. Um, I'm wondering how, like I think in five years or SIP 25, you have a, one issue where there's a lot of cell phone interaction. Oh yeah. I wonder how that's gonna play out in say 10 years. I know, that's so true. Is it gonna be, is our cell phone gonna be on our glasses or? Uh, yeah, yeah. just, you know, a little dot in your ear, uh -huh. uh, an earring. Um, yeah, you know how you see those movies that are 15 years old or a TV show and they pull out their cell phone in their car and it's a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> with, a, with a huge antenna. <laughs> or the car they get out of. The car they get out of is, is all boxy and square and puffing out gray smoke. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I thought about that when I did that, uh, um, about the cell phone conversation between Kachu and Tambi in, uh, I guess it's five years. But yeah, I don't know. He, that one needed to happen. They, yeah. they talked on the cell phone, what did yeah. they say? <laughs> So yeah, you run the risk, but maybe it'll be charming in the same way that, you know, you see an old 60s comic and they pick up a, a phone and dial the number. Or put the bat signal out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's it for me. I hope you guys have a great week. What are you drawing today? Today I'm gonna draw a, a female robot. Let's just draw a robot. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I've noticed that the way I've been talking about how to draw is very compartmentalized. You know, think of this, 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 these sections. Well, that certainly lends itself to drawing robots or androids or something like that. So maybe it might be fun to really accentuate those sections of the anatomy and see what we come up with in the drawing. So. Okay. Yeah. Meet me here. So last week, um, we drew this from scratch. Remember, Remember, I, I blow off the RE on remember. I always just say member. Remember how um, I had a little doodle and I like this pose, but I said it was complicated. And so we just kind of drew it from scratch. This is the final sketch that I ended up with. Um, it ended up being um, a little more than I expected. Um, but so, it, and it was also a little off to one side on the page. So I put in a window here just to give it a balance. Um, but I did get what I was looking for out of the sketch, which was mainly, um, you know, this complicated pose where the arm is back, the body is in the middle, the legs are up front. Um, and just trying to figure out how to get that, that body weight to lean on that arm and look natural. Um, so there's the finished sketch. Um, and then after that, during the week, I drew this kind of Catwoman looking sketch. Um, it kind of stops at the end of the page down here. But I just wanted to draw uh, something a little edgy. Um, I don't know if she's edgy, um, but she has this cat of nine tails. Um, and she has these really wicked... <laughs> killer fingernails that you do not want on your face. Uh, there's, I had, I started with the cat paw prints tattoos, and then I thought, well, there's probably tattoos everywhere. 
so I put a cat tattoo right here. And Robin said she didn't really care for the cat tattoo. Um, so I put it to a vote on Twitter uh, with a poll. And 53% of the people voted to keep the cat. 47% voted to get rid of the cat. So the cat stays. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was the sketches for the week. And then I was drawing this um, this figure right here and it has kind of a, my version of anime face. Um, just because it's simple with a simple nose, happy eyes, um, happy smile. And then kind of, a, you know, this haircut has been, I was drawing it and I was thinking, well, I started thinking, you know, some sort of cute, corny character. But then I thought, man, this wig has been on so many sci-fi women in movies. Um, I, I mean, you could just, how many times have you seen that wig in a sci-fi movie? <laughs> right? So if I began to think of her as a robot, uh, and I didn't mean to draw her as a robot, but you could easily turn her into a robot. If you took these uh, clothes off, you could easily have these markers uh, right in here, right in here, and the knee thing. Probably have a thing over here, and there's goes into here, and you can, and then you can get into all kinds of other designs where maybe there's a hip reflexor access point there. There's an access panel here. And on her back over here is probably a charging station. <laughs> Maybe it's more than one access point back in here. Uh, you know, or what? What if you put the charging station on the back of the head? I drew that. Ta-da! This sketch is actually from How You Like My Music. <laughs> Ta-da! Oh, man. Uh, I drew this sketch in 2017. I think um, it's older and uh, you know now you look at it and you, years a few years later and you think I can't believe I drew that because it's just not like me but you can recognize my style right here but everything else is just me reaching out and playing um, of course I've drawn Thor's hammer before because I've drawn a Thor story but um, I put the charging cables off the back so <laughs> even an AC plug, which I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know why you need an AC plug for a robot. <laughs> and here's a battery terminal cable, another one. And there's an Apple cable, you know, and I don't know what the hell that is. And then some other stuff. So, um, and then I just made this crap up. Uh, what is in here? And obviously it's, looks like it's kind of broken, doesn't it? Disconnected. But I just kind of did a, um, you know, tinker toy machinery uh, inside there. And then the same down in here, I just kind of let my imagination run wild, to tell you the truth. And I just started drawing three-dimensional layered, upon, layer behind layer behind layer of cabling that was disconnected and all needs to be connected and all that. And then, like, for the arm, clearly we have, like, a steel or titanium uh, piece of metal here and then a, a joint and then comes down to a threaded bar <laughs> so there's like an arm joint right here that's going to be threaded you know like a pipe so there's you know like a steampunk this is very steampunk looking to me <laughs> this is not high tech um, and I guess that's why I went with the wood stuff back here in the background um, to kind of give it that, you know, this is not an Apple robot or a Bill Gates project. This is more of, um, you know, somebody in the Victorian age made this out of watch parts. So I thought that was kind of fun. Um, that's a little more interesting to me because I can't even imagine what NASA would make uh, and if it would be anything that you and I could equate to. So anyway, blank piece of paper. Let's draw some something and uh, see if we can get robotic about it. If I draw straight on to you, that's kind of boring. Um, 
Ooh, I tell you what, I was going to draw a profile. Let's, let's do a robot that you just discovered. So you open the door and it's a dark closet. And there inside is this robot that looks up at you. How creepy is that? You think it's a, a dead machinery project and then the eyes open and it looks up at you. I'm always trying to scare myself, I think. I'm a walking creep show in my imagination. Why didn't I just think, oh, you find a robot who's baking cookies. The house smells so good and you go in the kitchen and there's a robot baking cookies for you. That never happens in a robot movie. These are those tendons at the front of the neck, and then there'll be another one at the back to pull the neck forward and backwards. And then you have a jaw thingamajiggy here. Do we really need a mouth right there? We need something to crunch with, I guess. So that if you stick your hand anywhere near there, crunch. Uh, 4,000 pounds of pressure. I think if you put the scarecrow nose on here, uh, that's just, I don't know if that would really look very nice. So let's just make a cone that has no... Um, my pencil. I can tell it needs lead when the lead won't turn. And see how it's all flat and, and dry? There, now I have the edge. If you're ever wondering how to get the edge in life, Replace your lead. There. So instead of like coming over here and doing that and then having teeth, I'm just going to go with this. Um, and then, in the human skull, there's a cap line right there. A piece of bone here, a piece of bone here. I don't, we don't need that for the robot. The robot skull is going to go all the way to the back and then come right here. And there's a hole there for the ear. You can either put a human in the ear there or you can put an amplified uh, 1930s ear. Let's go with 1930s metro metropolis. If you have not seen Metropolis, um, the movie, the silent movie from the 30s, um, you need to watch it. It's so cool. And when you watch it, remember um, how people were dressing back then and what was going on. You know, people were driving these crappy cars and um, smoking cigars. And that was pretty much all they had to do and read the newspaper. And then this Metropolis movie comes out. And it's just unlike anything that anybody's ever seen. So it was the Star Wars of its time. Now, the great debate, would our robot have breasts? Um, I'm just making sure that I'm doing a female assignment here on the robot. And of course, these will be cables. These are all the plug-in charging cables. That's the ponytail. <laughs> this head's kind of big. Somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. That was too big. Pull the cables in here for a high ponytail. Okay. Um, so breasts uh why would they be there and if they are there why how big would they need to be depends on what's in them there may be something in there 
uh, and I'm not talking about Austin Powers robots with machine guns in their boobs. Um, so I think it would only be a utilitarian service. And the bottom of the rib cage actually turns out to be a really good place to um, to pause the body form. And this here needs to be a swing top. And then we have our pipe. <laughs> There's galvanized pipe right there. You could run water through it. And then there would be cabling on two cables on the front, one big cable on the back. And that would that would replace your um, biceps and then your triceps. Sorry, maybe so there'd be three cables back there. Uh, and then cabling in here to pull. And over here, we have the sheath on the entire arm. This is the this is the cabling. And then there's a lot of intricate wiring and stuff like that for there's this complicated hand thing going in here. Tons of little flanges wires going on in there. Fun. Okay, if I start putting, if we decide that this is uh, shiny titanium, then you have all these reflections here. And then this was very uh, Soriyami, uh, the, the sexy robots. And then if you put this line here, uh, right there to the point there, then if you go dark here and then do the lines, that's how all the Image Comics did their chromium uh, female characters. I think that was mostly like a Rob Liefeld would do that. And then you could have another reflection in there, right there. Okay, um, in here you can have a main shaft um, and then a lot of NASA wiring and plumbing. And then the hip joint reflexors that we were talking about. Like that. And now, when you get out here, there is the joint. Right? So, more of that arm over there. Actually, let's just leave that arm right there where it is. Uh, she's in the, she's in the shop. She needs work. Um, there. Really quick robot design. <laughs> I like drawing robots. Um, and you can picture you know the sheathing working here, and then you get a, a soft, flexible um, uh, cover in here. To protect the, all that, and um, gosh, if you find a way to cosmetically uh, work on the on the jaw here in the shop, uh, and get that to not be so uh, striking, you could probably put a wig on here, put here over the bundle these cables up, put them inside the ponytail, and ta-da you could pass her off as nearly human. What do you think? That's our robot.